Hello everybody, this is Professor Raf. We'll be doing chapter one, Managers and Managing, Contemporary Management. Today's learning objectives will entail describing what management is, why management is important to us, what managers do, and how managers use organizational resources to efficiently and effectively manage and achieve organizational goals. Objective number two, we must distinguish among planning, organizing, leading, and controlling, which are the four principal managerial tasks, and explain how managers' ability to handle each of these affects organizational performance. Very, very important objective to focus on. We must also differentiate among the three levels of management and understand the tasks and responsibilities of managers at different levels in the organizational hierarchy. Also, we must distinguish among three levels of managerial skill and explain why managers are divided into different departments to perform their tasks more efficiently and effectively. We must also discuss some major changes in management practice today that have occurred as a result of the concept of globalization, which started to really, really fast forward after the fall of the Berlin Wall in the late 80s, and the use of advanced information technology known as IT. Also, we must discuss the principal challenges managers face in today's increasingly competitive global environment. Slide number one, what is management? All managers work in organizations, and an organization can be defined as a collection of peoples who work together and coordinate their actions to achieve a wide variety of goals or desired future outcomes. Managers are the individuals responsible for supervising the use of an organization's resources to meet its goals. Management entails the planning, organizing, leading, and controlling of human and other resources to achieve organizational goals effectively and efficiently. And shortly, we will define those four tasks as well as the difference between effective and efficient. Resources include such things as individuals, people, and their skills, the know-how that they possess, and the experience that they have. Also, the machinery in the plant, the raw materials needed to perform the duties responsible the managers are responsible for uh, to create products or to render services, computers and information technology, and patents, financial capital, and loyal customers and employees. All of those are resources. The next slide, achieving high performance, a manager's goal. Organizational performance can be defined as a measure of how efficiently and effectively managers use available resources to satisfy customers and organizational goals. Now, let's start off with the next slide called Achieving High Performance and Manager's Goal with first discussing effectiveness and then efficiency. I believe that this slide really should have been switched around. Effectiveness is a measure of the appropriateness of the goals an organization is pursuing and the degree to which the organization achieves those goals. So what, how would one deem a goal appropriate? There are many different ways of looking at this, I'll give you one so that you could understand it very well. A goal would be appropriate if it is within the skill set of the organization, meaning that they have the wherewithal, whether it's financial or whether it's having the right people in place to get that goal from paper to fruition. So once we know that the goal is proper, right, we need to also understand whether, how, to what degree was that goal achieved. Efficiency is a measure of how well or how productively resources were used to achieve the goal. So first we need to have a goal that we sign off on that it's appropriate for the organization, that it's a the correct goal. And then we look at the efficiency of how well do we use our um, resources to achieve that goal. Perfect example. Let's say for example we decided that in our company we're going to sell two million dollars worth of product. And we decided in the beginning of the year that we have the wherewithal we have the capital, we have the plant, we have the people, we have all the resources we need to get it done. But at the end of the year, it cost us $5 million to make $2 million. So did we achieve the goal? Yes, we did. We made $2 million, but it wasn't efficient. Why? Because for some reason, we did not use our resources properly to get to that goal. Why? Because it cost us $5 million to make the $2 million. Now, there can be many reasons why that happened. For example, we didn't purchase properly. We overpaid for raw materials. We had too many employees. We were too cheap, penny-wise and pound-foolish. We had too few employees, so we had to pay them a lot of overtime to make up for production, uh, production lags. Whatever the case is, 
That is the difference between efficiency and effectiveness. We go on to the next slide. The next slide is figure 1.1. You can look at it on your own. Gives you different scenarios uh, between high effectiveness, high efficiency, low, low effectiveness, low efficiency, um, et cetera, et cetera. You could read it on your own. It's very, very simple, very, very intuitive. We'll move on to the next slide. Why study management? Number one, individuals generally learn through personal experience or the experiences of others. By studying management in school, you're exposing yourself to the lessons others have learned. Two, the economic benefits of becoming a good manager are also impressive. In the U.S., general managers earn a medium wage of $97,730 with a projected growth rate in job openings of 5% to 8% between now and 2024. Learning management principles can help you make good decisions in non-work contexts. We could actually apply the things that we learn here in principles of management and use it in our own personal lives as well. We move on to the next slide. We talk about the four tasks of management, figure 1.2. Planning is choosing appropriate organizational goals, and we spoke about that in the previous slide, making sure that there's an alignment between resources and know-how, and courses of action to best achieve those goals, the effectiveness and efficiency. We also have organizing, which is establishing task and authority relationships that allow people to work together to achieve those organizational goals. We have leading, motivating, and coordinating. Leading is the, is the top category, is the main category, but underneath that, we have to motivate and coordinate and energize individuals and groups to work together to achieve organizational goals. So the function of leadership, which is probably the most important of these four, which we'll explain why in a moment, very, very important, you will use your leadership skills to get everybody to do what they need to do. And finally, controlling, establishing accurate measuring and monitoring systems to evaluate how well the organization has achieved its goals. You need to have an accounting system. You have to look at the financial ratios. Right? You have to look at inventory turnover, debt to equity, things of that nature. Now, why do I feel, why in my humble opinion do I feel that leadership is so important? Because you could hire somebody to plan, organize, and you can hire a great accountant to look at your books. But if you're the owner of the organization and you don't lead, then what are you doing? If you hire other people to lead for you, then you're detached from the organization. So even if you hire somebody to lead for you, you're not a part of it. Leadership means rolling up your sleeves, going down in the trenches with your people and understanding what they need to get the job done and then gaining and garnering respect with them. We move on to the next slide. Steps in the planning process. Number one, deciding which goals the organization will pursue deciding what strategies to adopt to attain those goals, and deciding how to allocate organizational resources. The next slide you can look on your own as an example of Alcon. Look at it yourself. The next slide, organizing. Organizing is structuring working relationships so organizational members interact and cooperate to achieve those organizational goals. Managers must decide how best to organize resources, particularly human resources, which are the people that you manage. We move on to the next slide. Organizational structure is a formal system of task and reporting relationships that coordinates and motivates organizational members so that they work together to achieve organizational goals. The next slide is leading, articulating a clear vision, making it real and clear. People get it, they need to get it, which energizes and enables organizational members so that they understand the part they play in achieving organizational goals. All too often, employees feel like they're a cog in a greater machine. That if they don't show up in the morning, it's not a big deal. If you want a successful organization, every employee must know their part and must feel, not just know mentally, but actually feel that if they don't do their part, the organization will grind to a halt. Just like if you had a car and something blows in the engine, it could be, it could be the smallest part, it'll destroy the engine. Every employee must feel that without them, the organization is going to be terribly impacted. This involves managers using their power, personality, influence, persuasion, and communication skills to coordinate people and groups. The next slide, controlling. Evaluating how well an organization is achieving its goals and taking action to maintain or improve performance. We move on to the next slide. The outcome of control process is the ability to measure performance and accurately regulate organizational efficiency and effectiveness. Again, we have already defined efficiency and effectiveness. 
effectiveness is making sure that you have a goal that is proper for the organization, being able to measure it, and efficiency is how well do we use the organizational resources to attain that goal. Managers must decide which goals to measure and which are not necessary. The next slide, managerial roles identified. Managers could be could have decisional roles. For example, they could be a disturbance handler, which is taking corrective action to deal with unexpected problems facing the organization from the external environment, whether it's a new government regulation that impacts how business is done, or some sort of internal situation, such as um, productivity, um, there's an issue with faulty goods, it could be a human resource issue, it could be a sexual harassment lawsuit, it could be somebody said a racist comment against another employee, now that employee wants to bring a lawsuit, or there's some sort of unrest in the office. Those are examples. You could be a resource allocator, which means that you decide which projects get which resources and what amounts. We'll move on to the next slide. I'm going to give some of these managerial roles which are identified by Mintzberg. Look at the next one. We could have an interpersonal role. You could be a figurehead, outline future organizational goals to employees at company meetings. You could be a liaison, coordinate the work of managers in different departments. Again, read the chart for yourself. It's very, very clear and it's self-explanatory. Move on to the next one. You can have the informal type of role, which is a disseminator, for example, informing employees about changes taking place in the organization that will impact them. It's very important to be extremely transparent with your employees. They should not feel that you are trying to pull the wool over their eyes. They should feel cared for and well informed. Now, next slide, levels and skills of managers. A department, or as we're gonna call a functional unit throughout the book. A group of managers and employees who work together and possess similar skills or use the same knowledge, tools, or techniques. You can have specialists within that department that specialize in certain parts of the work, but they have the general information. So for example, everybody that works in the accounting department has a knowledge of basic accounting principles. Some will have more, some will have less. Examples of departments, accounting, engineering, or sales, or manufacturing. Moving to the next slide, figure 1.3, levels of management. At the top of this pyramid, you have the CEO, the chief executive officer. You have your, his, the next level is his inner cadre of top managers, then you have middle managers, and then you have the first line managers who manage the grunts, the guys in the trenches. Levels of management, if we have the next slide, the first line manager is responsible for the daily supervision of the non-manager employees. Let's say a supervisor who manages a call center, the people picking up the phones. And you have middle managers, supervisors that manage these first line managers. They are responsible for finding the best way to use resources to achieve organizational goals. You have top managers responsible for the performance of all departments, establishing organizational goals, deciding how different departments should interact, monitoring how well middle managers in each department use resources to achieve those goals. We want to the next slide, you will see, which is figure 1.4, will show you that top managers spend a lot more time planning than first line managers. You'll see the shading of red and throughout the other four, other three levels of management tasks, which, the, which levels of management have more or less interaction with. So for example, all of them, top managers, middle or first line, do all of the four um, functions, but the level of involvement is different. And you can see by the, so the size of shading, please refer to levels and skills of managers, slide two of two, figure 1.4, to have a clear understanding of it. Now we move on to the next slide. Manage managerial skills. We have conceptual skills, which is the ability to analyze and diagnose a situation and distinguish between cause and effect. You can walk into a doctor's office and say, I have a headache. The doctor just says, take two of these and call me in the morning. He's not really a good doctor. The person can have a headache, you know, sinus infection, he could have migraine headaches, he may need neurological interventions. So if a doctor doesn't look at the, the root cause, he's not really a very good doctor. And the same thing is true with a manager. A manager that doesn't look at the root cause of the problem is not a very good manager. You need to have human skills, the ability to understand, alter, lead, and control the behavior of other individuals and groups. Technical skills, job-specific skills required to perform a particular type of work or occupation at a high level. Core competency, which is the next slide, specific set of departmental skills, abilities, knowledge, and experience that allows one organization to outperform its competitors. Skills for a competitive advantage are gleaned within this, you know, from the skill set of the core competencies that the individual manager has and also employees. Structuring the next slide, um, it's quite a painful term, 
but restructuring is downsizing an organization by eliminating the jobs of large numbers of top, middle, and first-line managers and non-managerial employees. Outsourcing, contracting with another company, usually in a low-cost country abroad to perform a work activity that the company previously performed itself. Look at Nike, for example. If Nike were made in America, the price of a Nike shoe would go from, let's say, $120 to maybe $300 or $220 or $250 because of the cost structures that we have in America. We don't, you, don't, you may not have a minimum wage in Sri Lanka or wherever they make those shoes. Empowerment, the next slide, this is very important. Giving employees more authority and responsibility over how they perform their work activities. I'm going to be all about giving empowerment to my employees because I myself, as a manager, am not a micromanagement type. Unless if an employee behaves in a certain way and they slack off and I have to closely monitor them, I will do so. But if I have to do that quite often with an employee, then I'll get rid of them because I cannot function with an employee that requires hand-holding 24-7. They can't think on their own, they can't think out of the box, then I'm sorry, they're not the right type of employee for me, because I'm all about delegating. If you don't delegate as a manager, then you're a micromanager. If you're micromanagement, if you're micromanaging your employees, you're not a very good manager, actually an awful manager. And you probably won't have a social life either because you're too busy at work doing everybody else's work except yours, so you'll be sleeping there practically. Next slide. Challenges for management in a global environment. Building a competitive advantage, maintaining ethical and socially responsible standards, managing a diverse workforce, utilizing IT and e-commerce, practicing global crisis management as organizations open up branches all throughout the world. Those countries that they open their businesses in will have their own crises, which have to be managed by the organizational headquarters. Next slide, building competitive advantage. A competitive advantage is the ability of one organization to outperform other organizations because it produces desired goods or services more efficiently and effectively than its competitors. Innovation, the process of creating new or improved go goods and services or developing better ways to produce or provide them. The next slide, figure 1.6, building blocks of competitive advantage. Those are efficiency, innovation, responsive to the customers, and of course, overall quality. Next slide is an example, Alcon, you can look at it on your own. Turnaround management. Next slide after that, creation of a new vision for a struggling company using a new approach to planning and organizing to make better use of a company's resources allow it to survive and eventually prosper. Next slide. Maintaining ethical and socially responsible standards. We'll talk about this as a separate chapter, but to just introduce the idea, managers are under considerable pressure to make the best use of resources. As such, too much pressure may induce managers to behave unethically and even illegally. So when you pressure people, they may crack. And if they crack, they may do things that they wouldn't usually do. Next slide. Managing a diverse workforce. We'll talk about it more later on. To create a highly trained and motivated workforce, managers must establish human resource management, otherwise known as HRM, procedures that are legal and fair and do not discriminate against organizational members. Practicing global crisis management. Create teams to facilitate rapid decision making and communication. Establish the organizational chain of command and reporting relationships necessary to mobilize a fast response. Number three, recruit and select the right people to lead and work in such teams. Number four, develop bargaining and negotiating strategies to manage the conflicts that arise. We'll move on to the next slide. We have video PODS. How do the employees at PODS use planning, organizing, leading, and controlling to manage 140,000 containers of service? Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to put a link in for this, but you can definitely access this through your student version. And if you can't for some reason, and contact me at professorrovt at gmail.com, and I'll try to figure out a way of getting it to you. Now, Appendix uh, 1, Figure 1.1, Efficiency and Effectiveness and Performance in an Organization. This is basically just a review of what Figure 1.1 was, which I said look at it for yourself, and you will have access to these slides. Uh, also, Appendix number 2, you'll have basically a review of the planning, organizing, and controlling. And of course, the other appendices will do the same thing, go through some of the core um, things that we discussed, because I'm going to be uploading the PowerPoints that are basically my own PowerPoints, my own, with the teacher's manual. It's not really a complete manual. I wouldn't give you the teacher's manual, obviously, for obvious reasons. But what I'm going to give you is the appendices, which kind of review some of the concepts that may have been a little bit, uh, I'm going to cover it a little bit too quickly and gives you the ability to read it over again. 
I urge you to read the book as well as understand, read the slides. This way when you come in, even if you scan through the chapter and when you come into class, you'll be more um, aware of what's going on and able to ask questions, better questions. Thank you very much and have a great day.